Hey everyone, Irene Lyon here, and welcome to this entire world of nervous system health and healing. Today I have a long form interview for you with a returning guest. Her name is Erica Lavella. She is a doctor, a surgeon. Technically, she is a bariatric surgeon. We did a talk earlier in 2023 titled Birthing Babies the Way Nature Intended. Now, I do truly recommend that listen, that interview, that talk. Um, it talks about her own personal experience birthing her second child in a more, we could say, naturalistic, biological way. She calls it a, a physiologic birth. How her second child was very different than her first, first child that was, we could say, medicalized in a hospital and full of stress. So be sure to check that one out. We will link that somewhere near here. But I wanted to have her back on to talk more about her expertise as a surgeon, as a physician, doing surgery to help folks who are, she would call, obese and living in a state of body composition that is unhealthy for them. Now, I know this has brought up some controversy over the, the years about is there such thing as a healthy body composition? What is that? And of course there is, and of course there are variations in what a healthy body is depending on whom you are, what you do, your ethnicity, all the things. So we dive into this topic um, in a very conversational style way. We talk about how she treats her patients, how she treats them with a very holistic lens. It's more than just surgery, it's lifestyle, it's diet, it's psychology, it's emotions, it's all of these things. And it's a topic I think that we just don't hear about a lot. Um, I think there might be some biases and pre pre um, conceived uh, perceptions around what what is this and why would someone want bariatric surgery to shift um, how they take in food, how they digest food, all these things. Again, I am not an expert, she is. So if you are interested in this topic and learning about healthy body composition and what that is, I highly suggest you check out this long form talk. As a reminder, I studied body composition. It's called cananthropometry. When I was in my first years of studying the human system, studying exercise physiology, and I found it fascinating. So we talk about that and some of my own personal experiences of actually being called morbidly obese as a result of the BMI index tables. And of course, we had a chuckle about that and why certain measurements that people use um, to put people into boxes aren't always the best thing. All right, everyone, thanks so much for being here. Have a listen, have a learn. And of course, we will see you next time. Hey, Erica. Hi. Good to see you again. Good to see you too, Irene. Round two. Our first talk, we talked about babies mm -hmm. and birthing them. You birthing them, not me, and your experience. So for all of those new here who want to watch that one, we suggest it because it was very good. And we didn't get to all the topics because you can't get to all the topics in an hour and a half, let alone five hours. So today we have a plan. We have our notes. And um, before we get in, do you want to just tell everyone who you are, what you do, all those things, and then we'll dive into the topics that we want to cover today around the body, the vagus nerve, the microbiome, body composition, all those things. Yeah. Um, so I'm Erica Lavella. I'm a board-certified bariatric surgeon. I also do general surgery, but obesity medicine and bariatric surgery is um, a huge passion of mine, and uh, that's largely going to drive our, our talk. Yeah. Um, I thought it'd be helpful to share a little bit of like how I got into this because I think it will segue nicely into some of the topics we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I was a child of the 80s and constantly exposed to, you know, toxic diet culture. Um, my mom was always on a diet. My dad was a bodybuilder. Um, and in my household, was two working parents and just an over kind of dependency on convenience foods. Mm -hmm. Fast foods were very normal part of my childhood. 
And then um, my father was a very picky eater and my mother was a very complacent wife. So with that, I didn't even know what a nectarine was when I went to college. Wow. <laughs> I know. I just lived a little sheltered life. Um, you know, most of our, you know, a peach would have been like a canned peach in simple syrup. Um, you know, dinner at, at that time, granted, as I've expanded my education around nutrition, um, I've also taken delight in educating my family. Um, so now I would say, you know, that's no longer the way that they necessarily live their lifestyle. But I was 19, I think, when I took my first nutrition class. And being in the pre-med track, you have to take all those basic sciences, all the organic chemistry, all the physics, and you can really um, bury yourself in that basic science. And I took a nutrition class and it was such a delightful compliment of balancing some of that basic science, but with real world application. Um, one of the first things we had to do was take a, just a three day, what are you eating? Write it down and put it into a calculator. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked to learn that, you know, 90% of my calories were coming from saturated fat and fast food and alcohol and all sorts of bad things. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I really, I'm just really grateful for that experience. And then I really threw myself into nutrition and used that as my, um, you know, undergraduate study major, mm -hmm. um, got a minor in psychology, which was also very helpful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when I went to medical school, I chose osteopathic medical school because they're very holistically minded. The tenets of osteopathic medicine are that the body is capable of self-healing, structure influences function. We learn so much about the autonomic nervous system and thanks to your work have really expanded the experience of that as well um, beyond just what we call viscerosomatic reflexes. So um, really enjoyed all of that. And then I also learned that, uh, you know, aspirin and statins is still primary prevention. And uh, I had more nutrition education than the person teaching the nutrition class at the med school level. Mm. We learned, you know, how vitamin C can lead to scurvy and how vitamin C contributes to cross-linking of proline and hydroxyproline for wound healing. Um, and we learned about vitamin deficiencies, but we didn't get any practical nutritional knowledge um, about, you know, weight, metabolism, or anything like that. Um, and then I was a little disillusioned mm. and um, kind of had to rediscover why I was there and, you know, what were my passions. Surgery became a pretty obvious track because um, again, that structure and function and then the problem and then fixing the problem. Plus mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going through all this schooling and all this training, how wonderful it is in surgery to know that you can save a life, you can stop somebody's bleeding, you know how to use pharmacology to support somebody's blood pressure when they're in sepsis. And um, mm -hmm. you know, I know how to put in a tracheostomy and I mean, it's just, it's really good skills. So it felt really practical. It felt really grounded and I always loved the operating room. And then when I was in residency, I did my first day of bariatric surgery clinic. Okay. And in that clinic environment, you know, you see people who are so eager to have their health, um, we call them comorbidities, but high blood pressure, high cholesterol diabetes and to learn that there's a surgery that actually supports them, but it's not just the surgery. Surgery is just the tool. There's an entire transdisciplinary program. I work with a psychologist, I work with dietitians, mm -hmm. and we collaborate together to help educate our patients to really offset, you know, all these things. So am I practicing preventative medicine? Yes, I'm pre practicing preventative surgery. And really what I'm preventing is a, maybe the onset of some of these diseases, but I'm also having an effect by teaching these clients and the, these patients what, how the body works, how to support the body, how to connect the mind and the body connection so that they can recognize where these habits and behaviors and these conditioning comes from how they can support food addiction, how they can support their nervous system so that they're more regulated and their digestion improves because um, our surgeries have a side effect of altering digestion. 
Mm -hmm. I educate them on the microbiome and like how our surgeries affect the microbiome and how their diet after surgery and before we had them engage in all these lifestyle changes before exercise. And I mean, I am just tickled because the long term <laughs> follow up I have with my patients clearly demonstrates just how successful it is and how how much education they get, you know, and it's different than the nutrition education we all got in our elementary schools, at least I can speak of you know, rural kind of middle America where I grew yeah. up, you know, the food guide pyramid, and we can talk about industry and all the different factors that come into it. Um, aside from that, I also had to come to grip with some of my own internal beliefs, thoughts, impressions, biases against, I mean, obesity, really. And um, with that, this will even say it way into kind of where we're going. The very word obese um, means to eat to be fat. And from a biomedical, social um, construct of human organisms, it is so much more complicated than that. Yeah. But because of the language and the rhetoric and kind of the naming and blaming of medical society over the last 200 years, it really does create this like toxic, uh, toxic shame um, culture around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I started really just listening to my patients. And so many of them will tell me, you know, I was eight years old when I first got put on a diet, oh, yeah. you know? And so then there's this nervous system activation of even like coming into a clinic and like the fear of even being weighed. And, you know, so many times <laughs> if it was just approached differently, Mm -hmm. And if instead of, you know, the personal attack of, you know, feeling not worthy of being in your body and not being worthy of, you know, health, then I think that we could have, as a society and as a medical, you know, community, really done more good than, than harm. You know, observationally, it's like as soon as we label something mm -hmm. and we create all these initiatives around it, you know, and obesity is a clear example, the problem has only gotten worse. It hasn't worse. gotten better. <laughs> yeah. What's the comparison to, you know, I, I guess we'll just say obesity. And I know, you know, there's almost like this dirty word attached to it. Would you say, like you said, you know, when you were introducing yourself, it was obesity medicine, mm -hmm. if I heard that mm -hmm. correctly. So we'll just call it for what it is. Um, first, can you can we define that? But then I'd like to know the difference in societies, North America compared to Europe, compared to Asia. I don't know if you've looked at those sort of sociological differences, um, if we would call it sociology, but just the, the stats, how are they different? Are, are they similar here on the North American soil to Europe? My sense is probably not, but... Um, so those are the first two questions I'll ask. Can we yeah. define obesity? Um, and then just how this might differ within the Earth's population. Yeah, well, I tell my patients, I, I offer disclaimer. I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm gonna use obesity because we're doing metabolic surgery. Right. Um, but I understand that it is a very triggering word because of the connotations of where it's come from. And I share with them that literally, you follow the etymology and in the 1700s, Oxford Dictionary, obese is to eat to be fat, but we understand it's much more complicated than that. So I define it as the carrying of excess weight that can trigger an inflammatory state in the body, predisposing people to these metabolic diseases. And then I take it a step further as, you know, we're, we're tackling the hormonal changes and the hormonal cascade that can impact obesity with our surgery, but we can't do it with surgery alone. We have to do it with these lifestyle changes mm -hmm. and diet being one of the more thing, like the external thing in a person's environment that somebody really has control over. We don't have control over our genetics and our ancestry and all of that. But what we do have control over is this new understanding that our food has value. And when we view it as currency of energy in our bodies and we see what good, you know, raw, whole, or not even raw, but whole foods have for mm -hmm. us, um, then we can really sort of redevelop and sort of reset that. So when you look at all the populations around the globe, what you see over time is a westernization 
yes. that is spreading. Um, yeah. I'll say, for example, in the Middle East is some of the fastest rising rates of, you know, this level of obesity. And again, we'll talk about BMI. We'll talk about the flaws with that. We'll talk about the mischaracterization. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in order to be a bariatric surgery candidate, and even this pendulum is swinging a little bit, classically, it was a body mass index of 40 or greater without having metabolic disease. So at 40 or greater, it's estimated that 60% of people will have metabolic disease, but 40% are healthy. For those that don't know what metabolic disease means or yeah. the definition, can you give an outline of what that is? Yeah, so largely it's insulin resistance. So mm -hmm. polycystic ovarian syndrome counts um, on the spectrum of metabolic disease. It's um, diabetes, um, mm -hmm. which is you know insulin resistance just mm -hmm. manifested as um, blatant diabetes and needing you yeah. know medications or uh, more aggressive dietary changes uh, to accomplish that mm -hmm. and then outside of that it's a constellation of having high cholesterol but high cholesterol enough that puts you in a disease category risk of you know heart disease and stroke mm -hmm. um, and then you know it goes even beyond that into osteoarthritis um, and high blood pressure mm -hmm. and um, I mean, there's a whole constellation of, of symptoms, but when you have that sort of arthritic joint pain that can happen much younger in somebody than you think would classically have arthritic joint pain, mm -hmm. um, and then you have you know the high blood pressure, the high cholesterol, and the diabetes, we actually call that trifecta um, metabolic syndrome. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so I wanted that to just be clear so that yeah. people know what that, yeah. that is. Because we hear about diabetes, we hear about heart, heart problems, but it's like a cluster mm -hmm. um, that it sounds like um, it's more prevalent when the BMI, if we use that term and we're going to talk about that, is over 40. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But my sense is, and I know this, that someone doesn't have to have a BMI that's high and they can still have these problems. Yes. So you mentioned, you know, across the globe, um, Asian criteria is actually mm -hmm. lower. So at a body mm -hmm. mass index of 27, they're more likely to have metabolic disease. Interesting. So, um, and then when you look at, yeah, Western kind of Anglo-Saxon ancestry, it's mm -hmm. closer to 40. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it depends on our genetic uh, makeup and our ancestral uh, composition. So sometimes we see it as early as 30. Mm -hmm. So the new indications for bariatric mm -hmm. surgery are a body mass index of 30 or greater with type 2 diabetes or 35 or greater with all comers, because what they found is that at the higher BMIs, if people really, they see what I do as a last resort mm -hmm. because of a lot of things in our history. Surgery is now much safer than it's ever been. We do it minimally yeah. invasive and we have this full, like I said, transdisciplinary interactive team of dietitians mm -hmm. and psychologists. So it's much safer than it's ever been. But if people wait too long, BMI's 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Ooh, yeah. Um, I've actually operated on somebody with a BMI of 100, which meant they were just as wide as they are tall. Yes. Um, it just gets harder and harder to actually reverse the metabolic disease or mm -hmm. to have them lose significant amounts of weight to where they can, again, fall into this defined category of, of normal. Right. So our society is actually advocating lobbying right now across all of America um, that our state legislators really listen to us and we, we offer these interventions um, to people earlier in their um, weight journey. Yes, thank you. Okay, I have another thing I want you to define. What happens in bariatric surgery? Yeah. Because well, I want to, I, I have this like idea, but I don't think I actually know. Yeah. Well, um, people might be aware of uh, the medical device like a lap band that kind of went in vogue and it kind of went out of vogue here in America. We don't have socialized medicine. Follow-up mm -hmm. is hard. You have to be in a provider network and then otherwise it's just a huge cost to you out of pocket. Yeah. I think in countries like Australia, Canada, the UK, they're still used um, in better levels of success because it's mm. not such a cumbersome expense to the patient to then have follow-up and little adjustments. But that perspective is simply restriction. And so there so is, is... I actually don't... What is that? Oh, that I'm not so with that. it's a... It's literally this... Um, 
we say silastic, okay. <laughs> but it's like silicone, plastic, kind plastic. of moved together. And okay. it's a device that you wrap around the upper part of the stomach. And so you get about maybe an inch or more of, of stomach above the band. Mm -hmm. And then it, it has a port that then is put underneath the person's skin. And you mm -hmm. can add fluid to the port. So by f putting fluid in the port, it actually constricts around the upper part of the stomach. Mm. So a person's experience of eating is they just feel full and they feel uncomfortable if they eat too much. Right. But what can happen chronically is, again, without the right psychology, without the right There's... dietitian, without the right bundle of care, in the wrong individual, they overeat to the point of throwing up. Um, and again, we're talking not that much food. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a, but it is this sort of device that can then, the fluid can be removed so they can get, you know, temporary relief, or then it can be added in so they can get more restriction. Mm. For a lot of people, it did work pretty great. But again, mm. it's this follow-up and these little micro adjustments that matter. And the maximum capacity on some of these bands is like 10 cc's of fluid. And we're not talking just much. water, you know, or saline. Yeah. yeah. Um, so more recently, what my practice involves is largely removing them um, because <laughs> of those esophageal complications and... Uh things like that. And okay. I do um, primarily gastric bypasses and sleeve gastrectomies. So these are two surgeries done on the stomach. And one of them, the sleeve, you narrow the whole length of the stomach and then you mm. remove the portion of the stomach. So like the part that you eat into your esophagus, the lesser curve of the, of the stomach, and then it empties into the small intestine at the duodenum, mm. the person experiences a yes, profound restriction. Mm -hmm. And, but the stomach's a muscle. It will kind of relax and they will be able to eat more and more food as time goes on. And that's what we want. We don't want people to be chronically on 500 Restricted. calories a day. You yeah. know, that's not, that's not um, healthy. Um, mm -hmm. But initially that's the amount of restriction that, that they'll feel. And so that's again, where all of this um, nutritional coaching and counseling really comes in because mm -hmm. they need to be eating high nutritious, high quality foods to really meet all of their needs. Of course. Um, the reason that surgery has metabolic effects is because our hunger hormone is actually released by the stomach tissue itself. And, and that so, hormone is ghrelin. Ghrelin. Mm -hmm. It's like is like the is that the cousin of leptin? Yes. Yes. That's what I thought. Yes. Okay. So this leptin is, me, is the hormone that tells us I am fed, I am satisfied, and that's why it's encouraged that um, we eat more slowly. Yeah. Um, and also for neuroregulation uh, aspect, we need enough parasympathetic activation to mm -hmm. properly get in our bodies and allow our stomach acid to be made. And so we mm -hmm. can properly digest our food and, mm -hmm. you know, digestive enzymes are a big component of the whole vagal connection here. Yeah. But so there, there's that. And then um, aside from that gastric bypass has an extra added benefit which is um, you make about a two inch um, stomach pouch, kind of like what the band would kind of constrict around, and mm -hmm. you staple that off. So you separate the stomach into two pieces, a little okay. two centimeter by two centimeter, and I'm ballparking here, but yeah, a little segment, and then the rest of the stomach. And so they're in separate two pieces. And then you find the small intestine and it's a certain distance and then you cut it there and you bring up the lower intestine and you sew it to the, we call it the pouch, the small stomach. Yeah. yeah. And then the part that carries all the digestive enzymes from the pancreas and whatnot, then it's sewn into itself. So you get this Y. This surgery has a very fascinating side effect, which is right. in people who have insulin resistance, simply by fasting the duodenum, by not putting any food in the duodenum, putting it into the small intestine. If people were to eat fruit, oranges can spike people's blood sugar pretty significantly, yeah. um, you know, watermelon, grapes, or let's say our favorite ice cream or mm. cookie or, you know, candy or uh, full sugar soda. Yeah. What'll happen is the small intestine right after the pouch will sense that and people will overdose in terms of the normal insulin response. I so see. people become insulin sensitive That's overnight. Cool. And I listened to a presentation, this was a uh, research study done in Korea, but they had done a sham feeding. 
so, so to speak. So they had randomized people to getting fed into their real stomach, or the we call it the remnant, but into the, their normal stomach, the same calorie load, the same everything, but tube feeding formula into the duodenum, like normal, after mm-hmm. gastric bypass. And mm-hmm. then they randomized the other people into feeding them by mouth. Mm-hmm. So the ones fed by mouth where the food went straight into the small intestine and bypassed the duodenum, they're the ones that had the diabetes reversal. The other ones didn't. Did not. That darn duodenum. I know. Well, <laughs> and again, it, it, it just also characterizes the impact in terms of diet that we have on our ability to regulate our, our insulin response. Yeah. You know, and this is why low carb diets and paleo and keto and, you know, all the things when you really eliminate processed sugar from your diet, I mean, great, great, good things happen. Mm-hmm. Almost over, it's almost overnight too. People notice the differences. Um, I'm not a sugar person. I know some people who are, so it, it, I, I will have a chocolate bar, like a nice piece of chocolate that's got butterscotch flecks and all that in it and I'll forget that it's in the kitchen because it just doesn't draw me whereas I have some friends who would eat that in one sitting and it just never why that is I don't know I'm but... the I'm the one sitting kind of person <laughs> <laughs> when you said ice cream the favorite I don't ever crave ice cream I don't know when I last had ice cream and if I do I can't eat a full scoop yeah I don't know why because oh. I wasn't depri- I wasn't deprived of anything growing up what's interesting I want to get back to the surgery piece but I have found that friends colleagues whom had the opposite to your upbringing Erica where it was healthy everything was organic nothing was processed those people that I know struggle as adults to eat well I don't know if you've seen this and my sense and of course this isn't a double-blinded placebo-controlled study, but anecdotally, I have a feeling that they were never given an opportunity to taste the other side. And so they get out of home, they're in college, they're living on their own, and they're just like, load me up with the stuff I was I was never allowed. So it's almost like a, um, it, they're swinging the pendulum the other way. Mm-hmm. Have you uh, seen that? Mark David is uh, a psychologist, and he mm-hmm. founded the Institute for Eating Psychology. And I've heard okay. him talk about this phenomenon, and it's just like everybody has an inner rebel, an inner uh-huh. rebellion. Yeah. And so, again, like from that childhood development standpoint, and then like, you know, internal regulation versus e- mm-hmm. or internal resources versus external resources. Mm-hmm. It's like it's 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 like there's almost this like self sabotaging right. kind of um, behavior simply out of just like lusting for that the other experience. Yeah, never got it, so I need to have all of it all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. Um, as you were talking about the surgery, I put myself into the shoes of a voice that I know I've heard before, not from me, but from various acquaintances whom this is going to sound harsh but you've probably heard this why should anyone get that kind of help when they've been lazy and haven't taken care of themselves and all the resources go to something that might never actually change them so that's harsh but i've heard it and that gets worse in socialized medicine situations where like i pay in to the my taxes, all these things, I rarely use a hospital. And then there's some that use it more. And of course, the system is different in the US. Um, What like, what do you say to that? Because you are, in my opinion, a very unique doctor in that you see the holistic side, you're clearly healthy yourself, which is, I think, rare in the surgical world. And you probably can verify that and vouch for that. So what would you say to that? Because I, I want to just put that in there because there might be this thought of why are these two talking about bariatric surgery? What does this have to do with trauma and the nervous system? And I think it has a lot to do with it. And I want people to understand what goes on behind the scenes with some of these people who in some ways get forgotten and, again, to use a harsh word, stomped on by some people in society. Yeah. 
I think um, it's a representation of, you know, so weight bias is what the psychological mm -hmm. community uh, describes as this level of discrimination. Mm -hmm. And it really is just blatant discrimination. We love to compare ourselves to others. We love to marginalize different, you know, communities and people. I mean, this spans racism, this spans homelessness, this spans, you know, all these different things. And when we don't understand it, mm -hmm. um, and we don't show up with compassion and kindness and curiosity, then it just kind of builds the divide. And again, remember the very word to eat to be fat, and then the yeah. origins of the whole BMI thing, the which we will yeah. talk about Get soon. Into. <laughs> um, you know, it was all bred out of an era which was the peak of misogyny. Right. And it just, even the very notion of making the judgment of, you know, somebody who is that overweight or that heavy um, and is using all these extra resources and calling them lazy, that is mm -hmm. pure judgment. Yeah. So that's not the whole story. Right. Um, and so in this weight bias sort of realm, um, this came out of Yale. Um, they went pretty deep on exploring the psychological impact of having weight bias and, you know, prejudices against, mm -hmm. um, you know, persons who were heavy. Mm -hmm. And what they found were a couple really interesting details. Um, mm -hmm. By age three, children already have lazy attributed to images of people who are overweight. Mm -hmm. they, are, they have mean mean and lazy. Mm -hmm. You look back to, again, all of our uh, cinema, all of our films, and every time there is an overweight person, they're portrayed as eating way more than anybody else. They're usually mm -hmm. the loud, weird, funny one, like look at Chris yeah. Farley, um, you know, uh, Rosie O'Donnell, which again, I don't mean to make these no, um, judges or assessments, examples. but like, you know, she yeah. was like the mean one on Roseanne. I mean, there's yeah. just, there's all of these public images mm -hmm. that really fit our narrative of this thing, uh, this whole topic. Mm -hmm. So weight bias, take it a step further, and it impacts the people who have that experience. Now they mm -hmm. also self-identify as those things. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a trial that they did um, where they showed images of those films mm. to people with an open food buffet, normal okay. weight and overweight people. Okay. And what they noticed is that the normal weight people ate from the food buffet willy-nilly, but the overweight people actually abstained and didn't eat in front of other people at all. And then um, mm -hmm. there's another like element to that, which is, I don't know if they called people and followed up or if this was a separate study, mm -hmm. but when people experience, um, you know, weight bias in the doctor's office, which is probably one of the most obvious places where people get it because we weigh everybody as soon as they show up. Um, and then the doctor's quick to blame their weight for everything. And then instead of talking about these health-centric behaviors, you know, oh, well, you know, um, or asking permission, that's the other thing. We don't get consent. We don't get consent from our patients to even talk about their bodies, you know? And we just, it, so there, there's two aspects to this. In my field, there is a big push to use person-centric language and also to treat obesity or metabolic syndrome as a disease. And so when we treat it as a disease, then we have the freedom to get more objective with the facts and it becomes less shameful and less judging. There was even a uh, kind of a Google lit review where they looked up how many times in medical literature um, we had used person-centric language to describe every disease process versus how many times we use it to describe obesity and it's obese, 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 which is like a harmful kind of like label. It's, it's not like we call people the schizophrenic. It's not like we say the breast cancer, you know? It's yeah. like, it's this very, like, it becomes a pronoun. And yeah. it's like, obesity does not define who you are. It's a label. It's a label. And so, mm -hmm. you know, just exploring all of this, and this is like, it's blatant in medicine, it's blatant in our culture. And so that also segues into some other things we'll probably talk about, which is like body positivity and like, mm -hmm. you know, what, what does it mean to sort of show up in antithesis yeah. to this sort of idea of lazy? Yeah. It's, um, 
as we know, and many of our followers know, my followers and probably the people that you are with, that we know the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, and we won't go into the history, we'll link that near here, but that was founded from a clinic that was helping people who were technically, I believe, obese. And they were having amazing results with a multidisciplinary approach. It wasn't just surgery and it wasn't just nutrition. It was mindfulness, exercise, support, all these things. Um, but of course, the outcome of that study was an accidental finding of those who um, dropped out of the study, and I'm really shortening this, um, and who had trouble with not just being, we could say, overweight in a way that was unhealthy, um, that they, they had severe adversity growing up, abuse, broken homes, crime, um, parents were incarcerated, all these things, emotional trauma. And so it ties in with this um, inability for the system to repair, regenerate, and stay metabolically healthy but also um, the ability to know when is enough. Um, and actually a story I'll share, my husband talked to me about this on one of our interviews, so this is open source. When I met him, he was definitely addicted to certain foods, candy, chicken wings, beer, crunchy stuff, um, sour candies, and he would eat and eat and eat and it wasn't because he was obviously hungry, but he had no feeling in his body, so he had to eat so much to feel full. And it, and it, it allowed him to feel internally himself as he became more regulated, as he started to work on the deep traumas of shame that had nothing to do with his body image because he wasn't an overweight kid or anything like that. He was later on, but that was for other reasons. Um, he, he realized he just didn't need, he didn't crave it. And if he tried to mimic the behavior, he would feel sick. So eventually he started to change his behavior because he actually started to feel terrible and his gut didn't like it. And so it's a long story to say, or a quick, you know, that when we've had so much trauma and so much shame from other means, for his situation, it was physical abuse from his father, emotional abuse from his mom, mentally unwell um, uh, mother. It was a cover-up, this, this, this numbness, and the eating helped him soothe, as we know, through the vagus nerve. It affects the heart. But then when he was safe and in a good situation, he kept up with that behavior. And it wasn't until doing the deeper somatic work that these things started to shift and on any given day, we eat about the same amount of food, and he's much bigger than me, more muscle mass than me, and yet we stay, we maintain. It's very interesting. So I had to just pop, pop that in there, because I know people know Seth, and they know his story, and so that also connects when I hear about your patients and what is being done at that bariatric level. Yeah, and you know, to the ACE comment, when we're so dissociated out of our bodies, yeah. um, that's, and, and you can layer into the fact that, you know, those highly processed foods, they taste too good to be true. Mm -hmm. And so if you're numbed out from your physical experience, then, you know, you're probably not going to really notice like Seth did, how unhealthy they were making him. But when yeah. we can find that inner sense of our body, you know, it, 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 there's so many really unique things. Like I see, I see people very quickly as the weight's kind of coming off, as they're kind of forced to eat differently. Mm -hmm. And as they're losing all this rapid body fat, it's like, whoa, the floodgates of capacity come out. There's so much more like, I mean, they're, 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 you know, speaking their worth. They're, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. leaving <laughs> abusive partners. Right. Yes. Um, and then they're like right back in my counselor's office, like kind of navigating. And I'm like, yes, like 
be aware that all of that extra weight that you were carrying is now like releasing all of that as well. So it's yeah. kind of normal to experience emotional, you know, lability yes. and, you know, kind of going through the motions of, of all of that. And like, mm -hmm. just to see it as one big release. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember an acquaintance um, who did have uh, childhood abuse and struggled with her weight she was losing weight and when she finally saw um i always forget what bone that is end of the radius i think <laughs> that is your ulna ulna it's the end of the ulna the, the head I'm, I'm bad with my arm anatomy when she lost enough to see that bone it freaked her out and she went back to her habits to cover up her body because of the trauma and abuse she suffered as a little girl and that was really fascinating to me. Um, no judgment, just interesting. Interesting that you started to see this drop and we could say on a good trajectory for good future metabolic health. And then the moment that came in, it was, it was a shock. It was, un it was foreign. Um, I'd be curious to know if you've experienced that with your patients. Yeah, I mean, I've heard you know, one woman um, who is very open about early childhood sexual abuse. And again, mm -hmm. total disclaimer for listeners because it's really heavy stuff. Of course. Um, and from that kind of manifested this desire to like, you know, not be desirable, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, to kind of retreat into this body and and then, you know, another layer being as young children, whenever we cry, when we're infants, we're fed, you know? Yes. And so Soothing. depending on how safe we feel in our environment, as we like move through different childhood development stages, mm -hmm. if food is constantly being put in front of you so that you'll stop crying, yeah. Or um, I see this a lot. Nighttime eating is a really yeah. big um, yeah. habit, and it's 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 one of the top ones associated with the clients I take care of. Is this nighttime eating? Mm. They restrict themselves all day, and then they're oh. just out of control, hungry at night, and mm. then they're constantly raiding the pantry. Sometimes they'll even sleep eat, you know. So they'll wake up, and then they'll eat a snack to put themselves back to bed. Right. And that our biology is just not made for that. We're, we're meant to fast overnight and, exactly. you know, totally. get good sleep. And so it's kind of like, you know, I mean, I have an infant right now. My infant wakes up in the middle of the night and I'm like, she might be hungry, you know? And so you feed her, but you know, as time goes on without those neuroregulatory safe environments, it's just food becomes a really easy thing to pacify ourselves. And it, it's not even necessarily addiction per se, it's just not being in your body and not really outgrowing those very early developmental stages because of mm -hmm. our conditioning and our patterning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so, you know, to then lose weight and then to be re-afflicted with, you know, I'm getting attention. Um, my friends are telling me I'm getting too skinny. I'm being hit on, you know, when I, you know, wherever. And, and, and again, it's, it's weird and it's insidious, but you know, we all carry mm -hmm. energy and there's, there's this type of, I think you described it really well in, um, some of your coursework when we've been traumatized, sometimes we don't really understand where safe is. And so we kind of keep yeah. finding ourselves in new, new life situations that are also unsafe. And mm -hmm. it's like for some of these women, they keep finding themselves in equally abusive adult relationships yeah. where they're verbally abusive and then they're drunk or then they rape them, you know, like they're saying no. Yeah. And so it's just a very complicated world. Yeah, <laughs> it's very it is, complicated. isn't it? It is complicated. And a piece on that, the food element, because you're right, when a, a, an infant is hungry, feed them if that's truly what it is unless there's something else going on in their biology that might be off they're cold they're hot they have a spike in temperature whatever gas right but there is that um if we go forward the reward system around food 
And that wasn't something that I know, um, say, my, for instance, my mother grew up with in the Philippines during the Second World War. You know, you didn't have that kind of food reward, whereas it's so common here. And of course, it comes down to affluence and how much money you have for goodies and treats and all those sorts of things. But I think personally that there's so much um, wiring around food is soothing because when we were upset, it was quicker to say, let's get you some ice cream. Let's get you something sweet. Let's get you this or you'll get this if you're good we'll go and pick a treat pick a treat you know if you're good in the grocery store pick a treat because that's why the candy bars are all there at the checkout and i see people that i know in that trap who who know we could say better but they treat themselves when they get a good job done when they accomplish something now i'm not saying don't celebrate with a birthday cake from time to time but there is an interesting psychology to this, but it's also rooted in the wiring of habit and behavior. Uh, absolutely. And again, that's just like another context, you know, um, mm -hmm. balance, moderation, regulation. Um, it doesn't mean you don't choose those things. It just means maybe there's more internal capacity for you to decide, does this fit your overall goal? Right. You know, um, that's kind of the language we use um, with our clients is just like the pragmatic way to approach these things. Because, mm -hmm. you know, with all other addictive substances, um, it's not like everybody's doing heroin around you, mm -hmm. you know, all the time. Um, I forget her name now. But she's um, she, she's pretty strong on like the the food addiction and the the, the sugar addiction front, mm. and she calls it the white line, and so it's like the white line, and this is addiction, you know, drug and alcohol treatment stuff. It's like you know you don't cross the white line, right. and like the difficulty is with people that you know really have these strong affinities for this reward system, and you know mm -hmm. that's where addictive behavior kind of comes in. Mm -hmm. um, you, you almost just have to kind of like swear it off, you know, yeah. but you know, but again, pragmatically it's everywhere. It's so ubiquitous mm -hmm. and it's, it, again, that's where I'm kind of like falling back on, on your work and your understanding and like building mm -hmm. the, the nervous system and mm -hmm. all the neural regulatory pathways and really developing your inner capacity, your inner yes. resources. Yes. And then when you have good grasp and you have awareness, because that's kind of where I'm at right now. I told you, like, I'm the one that would eat the whole candy bar. <laughs> um, I have so much awareness to when I feel the need to have sugar. And that is huge because that is the sign of, like, developing those inner resources, experiencing it. But just because you, ex you experience the thought mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. wanting it doesn't mean necessarily you have to act on it. Exactly. So um, the bariatric psychology world, they call that urge surfing. Mm. And I love it because it's like, it's just a wave. Like, it, like it, it comes and goes and even hunger, right? Hunger yeah. is like, it's a wave. Yeah. And so, you know, if you can develop enough internal resources to yeah. have awareness to those things, and then again, make it a choice. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like we put so much emphasis on willpower and willpower has kind of become this like dirty word, yeah. but like willpower is like a commitment to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a commitment to your inner regulation and you recognize that you are or aren't regulated, you can have awareness to these urges and then it can become a choice. And sometimes you go for it because yeah. it feels good, but it's a choice. And when you make yeah. a conscious choice, then you know, you don't necessarily have like the food guilt or like you're hiding it or, yeah. you know, all the other kind of shameful behaviors that come with it. And, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm talking about right now doesn't apply to people who are only heavy. It applies no. to everybody that has no. like an unbalanced relationship with, um, you know, the number on the scale or, you know, the, um, forgive me, the orthorexic community. <laughs> Remind me what that means again. <laughs> it's the obsession with clean eating. Oh, like only like no 
additives no yeah or is it, but okay. often when you're close to these people you see them binge eat on not so healthy things Ew, on the side yes. again like in a shameful kind of way um i've seen that yeah i've seen that in my own household with people <laughs> sorry those people who might know who you are is there'll be this very strong keto yeah. i don't eat carbs i don't eat this and i'm someone who will have goodies in in like not a lot but like a you know a nice bag of chips like mm -hmm. i said i'll have some nice chocolate bars like dates i know that doesn't sound like a treat but they're, they're sweet yeah you yeah. know and they're sitting in my fridge if it should be there but what's interesting is i'll see this strong dogma of this is the diet i am on and that's their choice and that's fine but then before i know it they've gone through an entire bag of potato chips I'm like where'd that go you know and i'm again that person that will have a handful i'll put them out into the cupboard and then they'll go stale and i'll have to throw them out because i forget they're there but that also is each person is different mm -hmm. um, i have been finding that when people are not well nourished with high density food mm -hmm. and good minerals and vitamins they will crave mm -hmm. because they're looking for something but they don't know that they're missing these yeah. nutrients a hundred percent a hundred and micronutrients yeah that's that's precisely um i i warn my patients about that a lot because okay. we emphasize protein so much in yes. the early post-operative period because they only have so much room and you know protein's really important for hunger control there's actually mm -hmm. a hormone in our small intestine that is like released by protein consumption mm -hmm. um and it, it's funny, I had a medical student working with me recently who's like staunch vegan for 15 years, only eats fruit until like 3 p.m. and then only eats vegetables after like a certain time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, um, <laughs> that's fascinating. Um, you know, I'm glad to hear that that works well, so, so well for you. And I'm like, this community um, that I work with, they have different nutritional needs, different nutritional demands. Mm -hmm. um, Plus, I feel like in this world, it's just so much better to be more like non-denominational almost. That's a good and way I of putting can't it. help but use religious rhetoric yeah. because there's so many attachments to, um, again, diet, nutrition, et cetera, that mm -hmm. then it becomes this like bandwagon, Religion. soapbox, you know, this is the way I do it. This is the only way you should do it. Yeah. Um, you know, you got Stephen Gundry who says plants are trying to kill you with lectins, and then you got the um, total carnivore people, and then you got Storm the makers, you know vegan yeah. plant. You got fruititarians, and yeah. you know our bodies are very dynamic, depending yeah. on our ancestry, depending on where we live, depending on our stress in our environment. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so many different many needs factors. the body has. Yeah. What I've found is that as people do become more regulated, they it's almost like they drop all, all these dogmas, all these food religions, because they're just more biological and they're more in tune with their natural rhythms and the earth's natural rhythms. And inevitably what I'm seeing as time moves forward with these cohorts of people that I see in here, what really is becoming clear is local eating seasonal eating mm -hmm. the way we would have back in the day mm -hmm. when what you ate was what was available and of course what's just been so um prominent as you mentioned a little while ago is the countries that are becoming more westernized with processed food and now i just heard the term ultra processed food the other day <laughs> <That's> ultra, <laughs> <laughs> which i think is what you would get like at a at an airport you know um, store where all you've got is gummy bears and chips and, and ding dongs. And well, that. And maybe that's like, uh, the discernment between like, uh, the non GMO baked yeah. kettle chip yes, <laughs> or like tortilla chip versus yeah. like Lays, Lay's barbecued, you exactly. know, something or Doritos or Cheetos. Yeah. But I, I yeah, I mean, food is tricky to navigate because mm -hmm. of just how you know it's like when when europe when world war one and two happened in europe they yeah. rationed food yes when we went to war 
that's when like businesses were like, well, now we just have to learn how to make it shelf stable and ultra Forever. cheap. And then, you know, we also saw women return to the workforce. Yeah. Awesome. But then we also lost the art of cooking at home. Cooking. So, you know, to praise Julia Child, she was yes. really like the yes. woman who brought the art of French cooking to America and made mm -hmm. cooking accessible again. Mm -hmm. And then um, now we have, you know, so many more people I feel like are nutritionally literate, but we still live in this paradox of mm -hmm. still wanting those foods and enjoying them mm -hmm. um, in moderation, but because they're so ultra processed, the chemicals in them actually trigger that reward center even more. Yes. So it's, it's just a, tricky. It's a wild ride. Yeah. It's it, it's crazy. And you're you that 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 transition, like you said, from the two world wars, and then that shift. Um, the Julia Child example is actually brilliant because the seer. I don't know if you did you watch that I did. show. I did. I watched the where whole. It, it, it like the whole history. Mm -hmm. um, it was a series and. Um, and the, the images of, I think it was her boss um, having this dinner that was like pre, I can't even remember what it was. It just looks terrible. And then towards the end, they were cooking like fine French cooking with the full chicken and the vegetables and all of this. And, and I just thought that was so interesting because it's so simple, really, compared to, I was brought up on rice aroni and shake and bake chicken and, and Hamburger you know. Helper. Hang yes, hamburger helper <laughs> and craft dinner with cut up wieners. And, you know, sure, I survived. But I also wonder if some of my troubles learning when I was a kid was a result of these processed foods. Um, and yet both my parents grew up in very farm environments where you had just the peas, the carrots, the potatoes, the meat that was just whole. And now we've kind of swung back. To eating more basic stuff my husband and i anyway it's very interesting it is it is i was in the grocery store with my grandmother and there was you know you know how uh grocery stores are these days it's just like processed food everywhere right yeah. just All always on sale and like big display and there was this pyramid of twinkies and hostess products <laughs> and she goes did you know these never expire <laughs> and i'm like yeah <laughs> that's why you're not supposed to eat them she's like i just think that's so neat and she like she goes your grandpa loves these and she picked up a box <gasps> so again there's like there's also yeah. just it, how do you look at it do you look at it's it attractive. half full or half empty you know <laughs> i mean when i talk about microbiome stuff with my patients i'm like look instead of this like restrictive this food isn't allowed like we, we don't need to blame food for things if anything learning about the microbiome learning about diversity and learning about, you know, it creates more abundance. You actually have more dietary abundance in this lens. Sure, we're asking you to eat more whole food, you know, living plants, but the variety available to you, and I don't even ask people to like cut out processed food initially. I just ask them to eat more of the nutritious stuff. Real? Yeah. Because understanding that that's going to nutritionally help drive some of those sensory experiences mm -hmm. of, you know, more fiber actually decreases ghrelin. Mm -hmm. You know, more fiber actually creates more serotonin for your body. So you actually develop an internal sense of regulation just through mm -hmm. eating these like more living fiber. foods, you know. Um, yeah, it's very, it's very fascinating. Let's dig it. Like, let's dive into the microbiome and... Um... You know, you, you said, I'm just going to read what you said in the email. I can introduce, I can introduce the gut microbiome discoveries that have led to a working knowledge that metabolism, weight, and the microorganisms that live inside of us and their behavior is linked. Tell me more, Erica. Okay. Um, so bird's eye view. Yes. Um, trauma. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was actually done by trauma surgery departments in the University of Michigan. But within mm -hmm. two hours of somebody being in a car accident and suffering a femur fracture, the likelihood of you developing E. coli bacteremia, which means E. coli was in your blood, was like, I don't know, 10, 15. It was just exponential. Hi. 
you always talk about in your work what's the difference between somebody who gets in a car accident who had nice sleep who had good neuroregulation who doesn't have anxiety and depression and you know addiction and yeah. they get in a car wreck and they're like oh oops let's exchange insurance information and you know it's okay and like you know they're they're put together they, they go have on. they have yeah. insurance they 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 handle it yeah. But then somebody else might get in a car accident. They have chronic pain for 10 years afterwards. They're, you know, immediately crying and hysterical because it's yeah. like the oh, next yeah. thing on top of the other things that are yeah. just too much. Yeah. So all of that together, um, I always like to imagine uh, the patients that were coming in and having mm -hmm. these, you know, femur fractures because... Mm -hmm. What happens, oh. so E. coli is a bacteria that's just in all of our bodies. It's mm -hmm. in your poop, it's in my yep. poop, it lives yep. there. Yep. And you know, it, sometimes it gets in lettuce. How does it get in lettuce? Well, because a cow shit on your lettuce. Yeah. Okay, that's or, how it got yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so E. coli and a couple other bacterial species, it's thought by biologists that they're just really old. They've been around a long, long time. And because of this, their evolutionary mechanisms for survival are pretty spectacular. So mm -hmm. bacteria sense your endocrine hormonal response. This is where regulation is the key, key. to everybody's gut health woes. Literally, stop. I, we can't yeah. blame our food anymore. We have I to take full you. responsibility for neuroregulation because this is this is where it's yeah. all at. Yeah, yeah. So there's actual cells that send up little antennas. They're called neuropod cells, and they reach up within the gut lumen, and they interact with different molecules that then are released by bacteria and vice versa from the gut from the brain down. Mm -hmm. So whenever a human experiences stress. Mm -hmm. We get corticotropin releasing hormone, which is like the precursor to cortisol. It's like brain cortisol yep. that gets through the bloodstream and it activates cortisol response from our adrenals. Mm -hmm. And then also epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are medicines that spike your blood pressure. And, you know, they're just designed to keep you alive. Yep. Well, in the states of these sort of traumatic injuries, of course, all of those things are circulating. And you can imagine they're circulating sometimes in some people just because they're late to work or because they got in an argument with their spouse or because mm -hmm. they missed a meal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so like we have yeah. a very wide variety of how our nervous system sort of interact with our environment. Yeah. But let's say you broke your leg, you got in a car accident, the ambulance had to come and now you're in the hospital. So yeah, you're kind of in shock. You're like mm -hmm. in that stimulated kind mm -hmm. of shock. Your heart rate's racing, you might be bleeding out, you know, everything's sort of reacting. Well, these neuropod cells sense from these gut bacteria um, that you might be dying. Mm. So they turn on what's called virulence genes and they start amplifying their reproductive cycle. Vir vir like virulent. Vir virile. Yeah, 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 they okay. go viral. Yeah. Got it. Just like your YouTube videos. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's a phenomenon. And then there's another phenomenon they call quorum, right? So whenever you're in a big uh, meeting and there's like a vote, you know, a quorum is like the majority of people are there moving in unison towards a direction. Got it. Bacteria can sense that. So when E. coli trigger this in themselves because they're sensing your threat to your survival, yeah. then they will quorum the rest of the bacteria and several other species start to die off, which only help promote the overgrowth of E. coli. Oh. That same stress response, that corticotropin releasing hormone, actually has the ability to break apart the tight junctions at the cell wall of the gut. Got it. And so, just by having an exaggerated cortisol or corticotropin releasing hormone response in response to, again, any varying amounts of trauma, depending on how you are designed mm -hmm. in your regulatory pathway, your mm -hmm. pendulum, mm -hmm. you get leaky gut. Right. So you get conditional leaky gut plus E. coli growing out of, going, growing out of control, and it will get across those cell membranes and it gets Junctions. into your bloodstream. Yeah, and, and so then you can get three. sepsis and die. So, Sick. whoa. Um, but like I said, mm. to even kind of scale it back from that, people experience corticotropin releasing hormone in varying states of neurodysregulation. And um, 
it happens a lot. And so, yeah. you know, leaky gut, leaky gut, oh, blame gluten for, for, you know, leaky gut. I'm like, yes, gluten is one of the most harder to digest molecules. Mm -hmm. And we live in a country where our diversity of wheat and our it's milling and our poor. ultra processed bread yeah. and, you know, all these different things taken together, you know, gluten is in everything, you yeah. know, it's in your toothpaste. Yeah. So you're chronically just sensitive, you know, it's chronically yeah. in your system. Yeah. And so with that, if you experience any elevation of that nervous system response that then promotes this, yeah, those largest undigested molecules are going to be the first things that leak across the membrane. You also get, um, and by the way, the gut lining is only one cell layer thick. Mm -hmm. So it's just a very vulnerable um, yeah. system. And with that, you get you know, inflammatory dysregulation, and then um, it affects your endocrine system. Mm -hmm. So um, women might have, you know, various estrogen effects depending on the population of um, certain bacteria. Lactobacillus in the mouth can actually dictate, um, you know, what the estrogen level is in different people. I mean, and again, the behavior of the bacteria when you look at it from that simplistic term of like, they're just trying to coexist and live inside you, mm -hmm. then that's where I'm like, okay, now we have even a more elevated perspective of neuroregulation. Yeah. And I, I say like, instead of being like a Motel 6, you want to be a five-star resort, mm -hmm. you know? And so you want to have the lush um, spa and, you know, the fancy dining and like, you know, you want these organisms to want to inhabit you forever. Yeah. You don't want to sit, create a situation in your body, um, where they're trying to leave because they think yeah. you might die. Yeah. That's not good. Interesting. So that was a macro cause there's so much complexity to this, but I think the key takeaway, if I just succinctly put this and tell me if this is accurate we just don't want to be stressed you don't want to be stressed unless there's a real stressor and you have it happen but like you said the car accident scenario as i often teach get to a place of regulation where it is not bothering you past that event mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because then you're just constantly releasing the the danger the threat and not only is it burning you out and causing you not to sleep and all these things it is impacting the microbiome and this this overgrowth potentially mm -hmm. that then throws everything off yeah i mean when we're in some hyper sympathetic activation mm -hmm. and i teach this to my gastric bypass patients because mm -hmm. there's only one little artery that goes to the pouch that we just created the stomach the stomach mm -hmm. and this is why I think peptic ulcer disease and getting ulcers is so prevalent in humans is because yeah. of the stress and the worry and all those things. Yeah. Now we have antacid medications which have reduced that, but there's harm in taking those long-term too. So my gastric bypass patients are very sensitive and vulnerable to ulcers. Mm -hmm. And why are they vulnerable to ulcers? And how come antacids don't magically get rid of it? It's because there's only one artery going to that little pouch. The stomach has four major arteries and other, you know, tributaries Surprise. perfusing the whole thing. Yeah. And our stomach is one of the first places where the blood vessels clamp down in states of sympathetic overdrive. Mm -hmm. Our blood flow goes to our muscles so and our heart. And so we can run and, you yeah. know, fight and flee. Mm -hmm. And so if we are in a chronic state of neural dysregulation, we're not perfusing the tissue. And so they get these yeah. tiny little white ulcerations, sometimes worse than others, but at that level. And it really is lack of blood flow. So it's like ischemia. It's ischemia, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Which is lack of blood flow. Yeah. Huh, interesting. So that, um, I had a thought and then I lost my train of thought there. Um, what I'd like to do is also get into BMI. I don't want to leave that one behind. And then um, talk a little bit more about the topic of shame and, and body positivity and, and all this. Recently, I had a comment and I shared this comment with you last night. I'm just going to find it so it's accurate. And what was so interesting is um, someone would probably take this as a real 
awful comment or a hit to me, it didn't bother me. It was under one of my videos with Seth, actually, with my husband, and they wrote, she exercises a lot, question mark. How come she looks obese? This doesn't make sense. And so I'm like, oh, that's an interesting one to get the night before I'm about to talk to an obesity surgeon. <laughs> so I knew we were going to talk about BMI. And so I thought to myself, I'll just do my BMI because I haven't done it in a long time. Um, I only know my body weight because I had surgery a year or so ago. So this might be different, but I am, I'm heavy. I'm 189 pounds. Um, and I'm 5'6", and that puts me at a BMI of... 30.5, which according to the, the scales is obese. So what's funny is this person was accurate from a BMI perspective, but I'm not in line for bari bariatric surgery. My metabolics are perfect. My cholesterol is perfect. All these things. But when I was in, such a fun story, when I was in um, undergrad doing kinesiology exercise science, there was a course called Cananthropometry, and that's the study of body composition. And we were doing breaths of bones with calipers, and we were doing my femur. And I still kind of remember it. The, 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 the classmate took my femur breath, and he wrote it down. You know, I've got all these charts, and the TA is walking around, and he saw mine, and he's like, that can't be right. And I'm like, why? Because, well, you're at the 90th percentile for men of your age. <laughs> so what that means, I really do have big bones. So it was accurate. It was so accurate. And if, if, if most people don't know me in person because they don't see me in person, but from a chromium to a chromium, which is here on the shoulder, I am only... I think an inch less than my husband who's 200 and like 60 pounds and you know built like a brick shit house and all this and and so so the the interesting thing is this ties in um diversity of bodies but also what we expect a female to look like mm -hmm. and um I definitely have a body type that is not slight it's thick, it's muscular, and that's just how I'm built, and neither of my parents have that body type. So where did I come from? No one really knows. But I had to share that because that was my entry point, and there was no shame in that, in that class. It was just like, oh, that's so interesting. You have really big bones. And hence why I was good at ski racing and all these things that required powerful muscles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell me what BMI is, and you also mentioned the history of it is interesting. Yeah, um, so BMI, body mass index, is how much you weigh divided by how tall you are squared. Squared. So it's just kind of a general surface area, like, mm -hmm. you know, how much mass do you have? Mm -hmm. But what's hilarious about the whole thing is, um, I mentioned peak of misogyny, so. Sure. Take that, take that into a grain of salt. Um, 1800s, you know, only men were allowed to go to university. Women mm -hmm. weren't smart enough to of study course. anything. Yeah. You were, had to be at home, right? You couldn't yeah. vote, yeah. you couldn't read. You, you were yeah. lucky if you could learn to read. Yeah. Um, so early 1800s, I think he was Austrian. I thought he was French, but I just looked this up again this morning. But mm. um, Lambert, Rudolph, mm. Quetelet. And uh, not that he was, you know, a misogynist himself. I'm just saying the era was peak. Yeah, that era time. was very, but, we have you know, a long way. Yeah, <laughs> we, yeah. Much to, you know, some people don't agree with that, but I think we've come a long way. I think, yeah, I think we yeah. have to. I yeah. mean, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing, Got you know. Um, but anyway, there was also the era where measuring everything became like the new science. Hmm. The scientific method was just starting to be there. This guy had his almost like a equivalent, you know, thesis on studying the perfect man. 
Uh. So he started measuring heights and, you know, coming up with all these different measurements, all the caliper things. So he's actually also credited with being the godfather, the founder of anthropomorphic uh, testing. Mm. Okay. And so with all of that taken together, um, really only studied the small section of Europe and largely men. Yeah. You know, so the BMI criteria aren't different for men and women. It's still right. height and, it, and weight. It's, it's close, um, yeah. Yeah, and then also only Central, Western Europeans were studied. You know, they didn't look at um, Middle Eastern people. They didn't look at Asian communities. They didn't mm -hmm. look at Native Americans, mm -hmm. Africans. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. and now we're just this big melting pot. They didn't even study Germans. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like, it was a very isolated kind of population study. Yeah. But what happened in America, because also at the time, whatever was getting published and put into print mm -hmm. was like the fake news of the time, right? Right. So nobody was there to really refute it. Nobody was there mm -hmm. to, you know, not until the internet became a thing and not until university wide spread travel and conferences and we have so much more academic rigor now everything can be contested and it's not that the bmi thing wasn't accurate it's just it was the first thing that came on the on the front yeah. and it's what stuck it kept it, it stayed. kept yeah and the reason it's kept is largely because in a nutshell it does capture Mm -hmm. who is higher risk, especially when you get at BMIs greater than 35 and greater than 40. Right. So, um, but the fact that 30 and above is like the cutoff for obesity is largely because of how flawed the original studies were. Got it. So when America started becoming established, so this is like, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later, mm -hmm. life insurance became a thing in the United States and insurance companies were looking for any way to not insure you as they mm -hmm. still are because you know that's an insurance company and they use these life insure or they use these tables yep and and again that connection there i don't fully understand their history of that connection because that's where they started to hmm. probably make assumptions yeah about being overweight and that leading to premature death and again there are all those assumptions about laziness, angry, eating too much, you know, probably drinking too much, you know, kind of like this gluttony picture, which is also mm -hmm. sometimes associated with, you know, mm -hmm. our mental imagery of like what an obese person might experience yeah. in public or away from public. Yeah. Um, so in medicine, it was identified that, yeah, greater than 40, is when you have a, um, you know, 40% of people are metabolically healthy, but the other 60% are starting to have insulin resistance, might have high blood pressure. And at that weight or at that kind of ratio, um, if you do have high blood pressure, even losing 10 pounds is known to bring down your systolic blood pressure by five points. So again, that's where the objective kind of health mm -hmm. data and like the paradox yeah. in this whole picture kind of comes in is like, there's still objective health information that yeah. we can glean. And if a person is interested in not being on medication and you know learning how to take care of themselves, or maybe they have a family history of high blood pressure, well, now you're heavy too. So that's just gonna compound that risk. Mm -hmm. So there's an association of you know a premature lifespan. You know, the average lifespan in America, I think, is 77 or 83 years or something like that. So you're kind of looking at 10 years shorter than that. Right. You know, um, so, yeah, I mean, it's flawed. But um, so, you know, in the athlete community, and I know a lot of men feel exactly as you did. Sure. <laughs> what? I'm those... obese? Yeah. You know, and yeah. so that's yeah. where I think the criteria get a little muddy it is muddy and um and again you know the person to make a judgment or an assessment and have the audacity to post it online <laughs> is a little bit of a troll but also sure. a reflection a reflection of maybe the internal weight biases that person has of course, you know, and so again, to like to get to the origins of that. So to bring it back to that weight bias, like discussion, yeah. 
physicians act very similarly to that commenter. I believe it. They're quick to identify and point out obesity as being the reason somebody has all their health problems. Mm -hmm. Yet they do that and they themselves might very much also be in that category. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry to the person who wrote that and who's listening to this. They're probably um, not listening. You're anonymous. <laughs> I don't know who you are. Neither but do I. There is an invitation to explore that about yourself. And yeah. when I started practicing surgery in interacting with persons with obesity, we have to use person centric persons, language. Yeah. It is an experience. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, those with breast cancer. You don't just say the breast cancered. You know, so yeah, there's a, a rhetoric kind of change too, but yeah, we're here to serve each other in mm -hmm. community towards mm -hmm. health. Mm -hmm. And so when we show up that way for each other and we lean in with curiosity and we lead by example, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I love taking care of my body. I love exercise. Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. eating well. Mm -hmm. It just like gets me so happy knowing that yeah. my microbiome is like tickled with yeah. me, you know, and yeah. every year I get older and I just feel healthier. And so I, I just want to lead way. by example that yeah. way, you know, without exactly. making anybody feel inferior or less than, or, you know, like they're not doing it good enough. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. Um, and I want to get into some of the other topics so that we aren't here for five hours, but, um, there isn't, I learn so much by these comments on Instagram and and youtube um but i would agree as i age age which is true chronological age is happening um i i feel healthier i i um you know I've, i do have some osteoarthritis but that's because of seven knee surgeries on one knee so i've tried my best but it's there um but there have been interesting comments and i'll say this one again um not this one but another one someone had mentioned um, and I have to paraphrase this one. It is irritating how good you look for your age. <laughs> and I, and I, I kind of thought interesting again, interesting. That's what I often say. Thank you. I think for your compliment, but it, we have this notion of what a person should look like at age 45, at age 50, um, at age 60. And it's completely skewed because of our health practices either being non-existent or high and so there's a comparison um and i don't you know i don't know if this is an age bias or what it might be but i thought that was fascinating and i also thought to myself well you can do this too um no one's stopping you and yet something probably is mm -hmm. and that's where the psychology comes back and the, the work of realizing that you do have free will to choose. However, if you are stuck in sympathetic and parasympathetic freeze, you actually don't have free will because you're being guided by your past traumas that are mm -hmm. still there. Yeah. I had yeah. to share that. Well, and on that you know, notion too, I know you've done um, podcasts with Sarah Kleiner you know, talking about depression and, yeah. um, you know, stress response and like, yeah. you know, that connection to weight. And we can think about it from a hormonal perspective. We can think about it from a psychology perspective. We can think about it from an internal belief perspective. We can think, I mean, it's all the things simultaneously being true and playing a role. It's not this person ate a thousand calories too much. This person had a knee injury and stopped exercising. You know, this person went through menopause and having hot flashes. And, you know, there's just everybody's experience is individually their own. But I'm hoping that your listeners are starting to kind of like pick up all the pieces and like connect them a little bit. Um, cortisol is very fascinating. I mentioned the leaky gut thing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it has a direct impact on insulin resistance as well. So I have a lot of friends in health, fitness, you know, obesity medicine, mm -hmm. and, um, what's becoming more trendy is wearing a continuous glucose monitor. I've seen that. Yeah. 
So a friend of mine's actually uh, okay. one of the kind of founding medical directors for a company called Levels. Uh -huh. And um, what's neat is very metabolically healthy fit people will experience very sharp spikes in their blood sugar mm -hmm. without having eaten anything necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but just by experiencing stress. And uh, I heard an interview with Mike Metzel, Munsell. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with him. No, I'm not. Um, he has a podcast. He has like a master's of nutrition. Anyway, he, he, he's, he's pretty nerdy on the whole uh, food, food game and uh, mm -hmm. metabolism game. But uh, he had told a story of going through airport security and his blood glucose went to over 300. So when the body experiences sweeping blood sugar spikes and then insulin crashes, our neurochemistry is wired to seek out a reward. It's like wired for like the pick me up. And so this is where it's like, okay, neuroregulation all the way from infancy, all the way growing through different neurodevelopmental phases. If we can learn what our internal resources are and have awareness to those experiences, yeah. sometimes we just need to deep breathe. Sometimes we just need a hug. Sometimes we just yeah. need to call our loved one and tell them what just happened. What just happened. Yeah. So we can kind of like drop it and let go, you yeah. know, like, like you said, kind of like process and recover. Yeah. As opposed to go and sit at the bar and yeah. take your stress level down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's so interesting because I, um, it shows that even when you are healthy, as I'm sure this guy Mike is, you're not immune to stress and you're not immune to these triggers in airport security. Well, and you can wherever. you can think about the evolutionary reason that happens. Of course. You're right. about to fight or run from this thing. Mm -hmm. Marathon runners, so I have, it, it, we, you know, exercise nutrition is a whole other like level here, mm -hmm. but you know, mm -hmm. long distance running, endurance running, sprinting, you know, athletic training, you need sugar in that moment as that yeah. fuel for that like yeah. hyper intensity. And mm -hmm. so it's like, of course, yeah, it's, of course it needs that to happens. be there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they go together. So the levels uh, friend I have, she said what's fascinating is as they're studying more and more me metabolically healthy people, yeah. they realize, and this is reminds me so much of your work in hormesis mm -hmm. and the pendulum and the up mm -hmm. and down concept is mm -hmm. like in order to build metabolic flexibility, mm -hmm. we actually don't want to carbohydrate restrict ourselves so much so that our blood sugar is, you know, 65 to 75 so consistently. Low. We yeah. need to experience the ups and downs so that we can build internal resiliency. That's fascinating. You know, like heart rate variability, yeah. Fibonacci. Yeah, yeah. Hormesis, people might not know what that is. Can you define that? Yeah, hormesis is the dose of say um, a medicine, a toxin, we can think about it as like, um, again, a hormone, yeah. um, but there's a certain dose range that is considered to be physiologic and healthy and kind of good, but if we get too little or too much, that's when it pushes us into the boundaries of toxicity. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So moral of that story, you gotta be regulated. You gotta be regulated. And allow and allow yourself to have some carbohydrate. It's exactly. okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's Your okay. body's designed to process it. It's okay. Yeah. 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 For those that haven't watched my interview with Jessica Ash, we talk about this. And um, I have a funny part in that where I apologize to the potato at how how much we've just, you know, criminalized it as this bad, bad food. Um, and she got a chuckle out of that. So I have a potato nutrition fun fact for you that will oh, help please. reinvigorate your love of potatoes. When a potato, oh, has I been, love, I love them. So do I, so, yeah. when potato has been cooked and then cooled, like in a potato salad, it turns into a resistant starch. I heard that. Yeah. Chris Crescher taught me that. So it's a type of fiber. Yes. More food for your critters that live in your gut. Yeah. Well, and you can taste it um, when a potato has been cooked and cooled and you eat it the next day and you warm it up or you eat it cold. 
it, it tastes more mucilaginous, mm -hmm. mucilaginous, if that's mm -hmm. the right word. Mm -hmm. Like you can tell that the fiber has changed. Mm -hmm. So, all right, everybody have potatoes in their fridge. Yeah. Um, let's talk, let's wrap this up with um, this idea of body positivity and shame and all these pieces, um, but also, you know, that as, as much as this is difficult for some people to hear, there is a healthy, there is health to our body weight. And there is obviously a huge spectrum of what is not healthy and healthy. How would you tie this into kind of a, a thesis, Erica, where we, we really want people to be metabolically healthy you work with people who are not, and you're, you are trying to get them into a better body weight, but we also don't want to shame. And we also don't want to be so positive. I believe that we're ignorant to real health concerns. What do you say to all this? Um, I mean, the analogy I have is kind of like parenting, right? It's like you mm -hmm. have to love and have like firm boundaries. The other thing I've learned as a doctor who just wants to see the best in everybody is like, mm -hmm. I, I can't take personal responsibility for their outcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm just like, oh, okay. Cause I get really invested in their journeys. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to invite your listeners to think about what body positivity means to them. Mm -hmm. And we'll just listen and channel that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that, I'd like to share what I hope body positivity truly means. Mm -hmm. I would love to see body positivity mean that people feel value in their bodies, mm -hmm. that people feel strength in their bodies, that people feel compassion towards their bodies. I remember doing that workshop with you and um, we had a German gentleman in class and he shared the poem, the poem he wrote. He had a conversation with his body. Right. And it was the most beautiful oh. thing. And so mm -hmm. body positivity is about having a relationship with your body and about understanding your body and connecting with your body, not being so disconnected from it that you ignore what he or she needs or they need, but you're aware of, again, that intuitive desire to want something that you understand maybe isn't healthy. Ask mm -hmm. why. Mm -hmm. um, understand that your weight does not define who you are. Mm -hmm. Understand that your, <clears throat> and this is where it's, it's just hard and painful for some people because of all of the years of, again, the shame and the blame and the laziness and the name callings and the stereotypes mm -hmm. and like loving yourself and connecting mm -hmm. with yourself and then developing an intuitive relationship with your body so that you can take care of those needs. Care of it. Yeah. And then it's interacting with the real medical possibility of what these risks are that mm -hmm. may be affecting you. You know, so again, exercise, exercise is the most simplest thing. We don't even have yeah. to change our diets. If we just move our body, the microbiome loves exercise, your stress resiliency, your cortisol, it is, it's stress and training, right? I mean, every time somebody runs the same hormones that stimulate a stress response are activated, but in a controlled way. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It, it's like, again, you're safe doing yeah. the things. This movement. And so movement, I think, is incredibly important. And so mm -hmm. if you feel like you meet these definitions that are arbitrarily assigned by skinny French men 200 <laughs> years ago, when women couldn't even go to college and stick up for themselves, and they didn't even yeah. study all the other populations in the world, and yeah. you have an ancestor, you have German, Peruvian, African ancestry. Mm -hmm. Do you think, you know, I mean, like there, there's no model for you, you know? No. no. So know your worth, understand your body, ask your body questions, and then monitor, mm -hmm. self-monitoring, self-checking in. So when you go to the doctor's office, they usually want to weigh you. 
My sure. office has gotten into the practice of asking permission. Asking. Yeah. So consent, that makes the person feel safe they can actually decide to say no if they want to. Mm -hmm. We can't give them a weight loss operation if they say no, but yeah. I see other patients as well. Yeah. Um, and then outside of that, you know, get your blood pressure checked. This is like a normal part of health maintenance. You know, it's just like getting mammograms and getting colonoscopies and, you know, checking reflexes and stuff. But so interacting with the medical community should hopefully feel safe and shouldn't feel bad but I think that's also sometimes a disconnect. It often is, and I have heard horror stories from my students, and I just keep saying to them, just keep trying, just yeah. keep looking, just keep, don't give up, because there will be someone who is good yeah. that you will find, but often it's such a poor experience, or they had such a poor experience growing up, or when they're younger, they will neglect mm -hmm. these things that really if they knew and did some little tweaks, it would make a huge difference. Yeah. But that involves, as I've seen through some of my more advanced students, we just did um, some beta testing for a professional training. And one of the projects that they had to do, we called it a self-care project. And it had to happen through the 12 weeks that we were in session. And they had to have a partner, a self-care buddy to talk to about this but it could not be nervous system based and it couldn't be meditation. It had to be food, exercise, circadian biology, or getting something figured out with your, your system medically that you've been putting off and putting off. And we had people find doctors. We had one person have a colonoscopy that they were afraid of. And, and it was, it was one of the most empowering projects that they had ever done because it was never done in a way that was safe. You know, PE in school was terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, all these things, just such bad experiences. But it was amazing, Erica, when you flipped it as, this is so that you can become a better practitioner. You, you cannot do this work if you are not connected to yourself and taking care of your body. Mm -hmm. So I love what you say about body positivity. It's less about the look and it's more about how you are caring for yourself mm -hmm. which can take some time to learn mm -hmm. how to do yeah i mean i just i hope that when people really realize that they're doing everything well for themselves then it you know and and then this is also where it's like you got to stick up for yourself like i had mm -hmm. i had a patient um arrive in my clinic with a hand typed out letter. And the first thing that person did was give me the letter. And so I was like, she goes, before you say anything, read this. And I was like, okay. And I sat back and I read the late letter and it went through all of her medical trauma, how it mm. took her a really long time to come in to see me, how she would be preferred to be talked to and what she was looking for in a doctor. And wow. I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's rare. Yeah. I mean, I was like, you know, thank you for doing this. And I kind of wish more people would if it made them feel comfortable to come in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another funny caveat to that, uh, mm -hmm. I was part of our system-wide physician wellness committee. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion about physician burnout and all the different tasks. Yeah. And, you know, just like you were saying, you know, your own providers aren't really in a position to really take care of themselves. They out, you know, they're constantly giving and they're not really doing yeah. any of their own time, work, and delaying a bunch of stuff. One of the older gentlemen in this meeting was like, well, medicine's changed. Patients are more complicated now. You know, it didn't used to be this hard. <laughs> and me and a female pediatrician and myself, uh. we look at each other and we're just like, medicine hasn't changed. It's just more people are starting to advocate for themselves. Yeah. And this, this is part of medicine. This is the part of medicine that never existed when you started. That was the paper chart, in and yeah. out, here's a yeah. prescription, yeah. buy. This is how family medicine doctors were raking in five, 600 grand a year. You know, I mean, it's like, it's silly. And so, mm. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is the work, men. Yeah. This is the work. Yeah. It's yeah. funny. It was really funny. It's good, though, to see that um, polarity. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Right? 
like to be able to move ahead in the way you practice, but then be sitting next to someone who is just not in that mindset and go, okay. Yeah. Cause my sense is you didn't try to convince him in that moment of anything. No, of course not. No. I just laughed. <laughs> I was like, huh? Yeah. That must've been the good old days. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that we haven't covered I think we, we covered a lot. To, yeah, I think we did. I'm looking at I my think notes. We covered a lot. Um, we got it all in. I forgot to also mention if any of mm -hmm. your listeners <clears throat> are in the middle of or considering or have had bariatric surgery, um, yes. I teamed up with one of my dietitians and co founded. Um, an online nutrition coaching practice that really yes. encompasses all of these things that we touched on today, <clears throat> largely because after bariatric surgery, it doesn't mean you're immune to weight regain. Right. It doesn't mean you're immune to stress. It doesn't mean you're yes. immune to a pandemic taking away your ability to exercise in a gym or your free time to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, a lot of people do experience shame and self-sabotaging behavior and you know so we have a program it's called art of bariatrics yes you can go to art of and mm -hmm. um there is a discount code for any time i do a podcast it's called podcast 20. yeah you can okay. put that in on any of um any of our uh programs uh, we do meal plans that honor the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. We are very fiber friendly, fiber focused, and we've had wonderful, wonderful success um, helping women kind of find balance again um, cool. in their lives through uh, education and um, just kind of, you know, dietary practices. Can someone do this if they are not a female or haven't had bariatrics? They surgery? can. Um, I would say you, you want to be open minded to the, okay. I mean, you'll know after meeting me today where my heart <laughs> is, how compassionate I am. Um, so if you are a male and this is tickling your fancy and you want to mm -hmm. hear me talk calmly with my parasympathetic vagal tone to you on online courses guiding you through your experience, then yes. It's for you. Perfect. If you um, if you haven't had bariatric surgery, um, our diet plans are still very effective for weight loss. But keep That's in right. mind the calorie yeah. count on them is quite low. Right. Um, but it might be worth a shot because I load yeah. you up with fiber. You probably won't feel hungry. <laughs> it's just and the, it's the type of food, right? The yeah. the guidance to healthy eating and healthy whole food. Yeah. My sense is it's. Yeah, great for a lot of people. So, yeah, perfect. so many of my clients have just been like, I didn't even know what this was, and I didn't know you can combine this with that, and you know, it's yeah. it's it's been pretty um, pretty revealing. That's great. Well, we will obviously link all that near here. Any final words for all the people who have made it to an hour and forty two minutes? You are worthy. You are worthy of your own neuroregulation, and yeah. if you are a grown up. It's okay if you didn't get it before because you have all, all the capacity to make it work now. Boom. Thanks, lady. Thank you. This was fun.